we had been uh, uh, looking at this chapter on uh, how to do equilibrium uh, how to come up with equilibrium conditions for deformable bodies and we had introduced this concept of um, of the traction vector and i pointed out that uh, these tractions are really distributed forces per unit area so um, let me ask you this um, if i have a beam with some um, distributed load applied here let's say we are neglecting self weight um, we would get reactions at the fixed end assuming the left end is fixed end and we found yes the moment here is p times l l being the length of the beam um, if i draw the um, if i draw the contribution of bending at any cross section that would be uh, tension on the top and compression or maybe i'll draw compression this way so compression on the bottom surface and then a linear distribution between them uh, sorry so hopefully this uh, distribution uh, makes sense to you that we have tension on the top half, uh, compression on the bottom half. Um, and as I pointed out, these are all traction vectors. If you go to a different point on the cross section, the amount of distributed force per unit area at that point is the value of this arrow uh, or the value corresponding to this arrow. So here's a question, what would be the total force acting on this cross section? If this were the traction distribution, Right, it would be zero as you all learned in your uh, mechanics of beams uh, on a cross section uh, only due to the bending uh, contribution. Uh, the, the axial axial forces, the tension would cancel out the compression, and we reach that conclusion how by integrating these forces over the entire cross section. Right, we integrate these uh, tractions. We do T times d a over the entire cross section, and then we say. The total tension should equal to the total compression. And that's what I'm talking about here. In, in general, in a deformable body, on a surface internal to the body, when you, draw, uh, when you draw these distributed forces acting on that surface, these are tractions. The total force is obtained by doing an integral of the traction times dA over the entire uh, area uh, that you are talking about. So this is an important concept to understand. Traction is a distributed force per area. Stress is not distributed force per area. Right? Um, so last time we looked at how stress is related to tractions by doing this um, Cauchy uh, tetrahedron, um, drawing the tractions on all those four faces in the limit that this delta x tends to zero. All that we did was we took that free body diagram, did sum of forces, and we came up with the relationship that traction on the inclined face, T sub n, traction on the inclined face is equal to um, sum from 1 to 3 of tractions, of the three tractions on the faces that are perpendicular to the uh, coordinate directions E1, E2, E3, dyad with their own uh, coordinate vectors, and acting on the normal to the inclined surface. So we saw, we identified this quantity as being the Cauchy stress tensor. And uh, we came up with this very fundamental, very important relationship that traction on an arbitrary inclined surface at a point within a body is equal to the stress, Cauchy stress, acting on a normal, uh, on a normal uh, uh, vector. And this normal vector, I said, could be any arbitrary vector. Go, if you have a deformable body, go inside the deformable body at some point, you can imagine infinitely many um, surfaces passing through that point. And those infinitely many surfaces passing through that point um, have their corresponding normals that can be represented in this way. 
with as an infinite set of possible normals stress acting on that normal can uh, gives me traction vector acting on that surface so at the same point the traction vector obviously depends upon the surface you choose if you choose one surface you get a different traction different surface different traction um, but all of them are related through this stress tensor and we also saw that um, the components of the stress tensor at least the columns are actually the traction vectors for uh, the, those coordinate directions so i think that's about where we were last time um, i very quickly sort of mentioned the uh, some common terminology that is used people uh, use normal stress and shearing stress again they should be called normal and shearing components of the stress or uh, normal and shearing tractions on a surface and what do those mean um, what we have here is uh, basically a traction vector on a um, so let me start from the deformed body um, we remember this picture this is the uh, this is a deformable body under some load and boundary conditions as we have talked about if i go inside the deformed body some point out here um, and if i draw um, if i take a section if i take a section at that point um, with the normal n as uh, as shown here and the blue is that uh, blue face is that cross section um, then i can take the stress at that point act it upon the normal and that would be this traction vector that would give me this traction vector this traction vector need not be along that normal as we have seen uh, but what i can do is take its components one in the direction of the normal and one whatever remains so when i add these two components i get back the traction vector this component here that is along the normal is called the normal uh, component of the stress or the normal traction this is the shearing component of the stress uh, uh, shearing component of stress uh, and traction so how do we compute those as you can imagine uh, if i take the traction vector here take a dot product of that with the normal that will give me sigma right sigma is equal to n the no the normal vector dot with the traction vector that would give me a scalar by the way um this scalar in the direction of the unit normal gives me a vector that's a uh, that's a normal component similarly if i subtract um subtract traction so um if you look at this quantity this is equal to t sub n this is the traction uh, vector um on this face subtract the normal component of the traction from the original traction and what you have is the remaining component that's the shear traction i think one of the homework problems ask you to do this right um so hopefully this is um uh, understandable um any questions on this um uh, on on what what these two components are uh, normal uh, normal component of the uh, traction would be n dot tn which is uh, obtained by n dot s acting on n and the shear component if i express this as sigma i n i can pull this out and uh, what we have is i minus n di at n acting on the traction gives me the shear component of the traction so um, all we are doing is resolving this traction along uh, the normal and something perpendicular to the normal jo you had a question um so if you just trying to find the shearing component then you will take the stress Subtract. You mean traction? Traction. So if you want tau, you mean? Yeah. Tau. If you want tau, then the way to do that would be to first of all find tau m because um, what you can do is you have the traction vector, you have the normal. You would have to find the normal component first. subtract out the normal component you would you would get the shearing component and then divide it by the uh, or just take the magnitude of that shearing component that would be equal to tau make sense yeah. okay all right 
let's take a look at a few examples of state of stress and this is another term that you might have heard before uh, stress is not um, a unique scalar quantity so uh, the, we always refer to a state of stress at a point inside a body um, and by the way stress is a field so stress is always expressed as stress at a point if you say the stress in this body is whatever uh, that that's not meaningful you have to say stress at a point at what point in the body is 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 this tensor um, and um, so the uh, the tensor itself is sometimes called the state of stress um, here are some examples of states of stress or essentially stress tensors uh, one is the simplest one is a hydrostatic pressure or hydrostatic state of stress what that corresponds to is um, like um, like a body submerged in some fluid, say water. Uh, we know that if I go deep, uh, some amount of uh, uh, some depth D1, let's say, I get some hydrostatic pressure P1. If I go deeper, the pressure increases. So that's why I'm calling these two states of stress as uh, P1 and P2. But what the hydrostatic uh, state of stress um, represents, it, it is really an identity tensor multiplied with this minus P1. Um, and I think in your books, this is referred to as, um, as maybe positive P1. And I've changed those signs in some of those places. Um, but um, what this means is really that, uh, that the state of stress resembles an identity, meaning if we go back to this picture, no matter what normal direction you choose, if you are in a point inside water and uh, you are trying to plot the state of stress at that point, no matter what direction of normal you choose, that, uh, the traction that you get would be just a, just a multiple of that normal. And the minus sign because pressure is inward. Pressure points in, inward rather than outward. Right? So that's why a hydrostatic uh, state of stress would look like this sphere of normal vectors going to a red sphere of traction vectors. And that's what is being displayed in this case and in this case that um, go to a point, let's say the pressure at depth D1 is given by rho G D, right? Rho G D is this P1. Now, no matter what normal I choose, for example, if my if I choose a small neighborhood of this point, which looks like a cube, this has normals plus minus E1, plus minus E2, plus minus E3. On all of those six surfaces, the tractions are pointing inward, um, so opposite to the no direction of the normal, and the value of that traction is the same um, everywhere. Let me ask you this. On any surface of a hydrostatic pressure uh, state of stress, on any surface, what is the shearing component of the traction? Zero. Because it is P times I. I acting on any normal is going to give you the same normal. Normal, so I'll maybe write that out somewhere. S acting on N would be equal to minus P I acting on N, which would be equal to minus P N. So the traction, which is equal to the traction on, an, on a face with normal N. So on any face, it is always going to be equal to minus P times the normal to that face. So uh, traction is along the normal for this particular state of stress where means the shearing component is zero and that's what is being showed in this figure in this figure in this figure you can see that in this case there are six faces oriented along plus minus e1 plus minus e2 plus minus e3 here there are six different faces yet the tractions are just normal to all of those faces here we have eight faces eight different faces and then the plus uh, uh, the front and the back. So there are 10 different faces in this picture. And in all of those cases, um, the traction vector is just minus P times the normal. Okay. 
this diagram is a small neighborhood of that point this diagram is a different small neighborhood and this diagram also is a different small neighborhood of that point these are just ways of visualizing um, a state of stress so um, the, the, uh, uh, these different three different ways of visualizing the state of stress are all related to the same uh, stress tensor okay um, so that's all uh, that is hydrostatic pressure means minus p times i um, another commonly used state of stress or commonly obtained state of stress is a uniaxial tension this state of stress is obtained for example if you uh, conducted some experiments in your um, mechanics of materials lab or take a tension coupon and uh, 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 put it under uh, uh, uniaxial tension. The key being that there is there are forces acting only along the axial direction, but no forces along the transverse direction. That if you take a tension coupon and you pull it, then you're allowing deformation in the transverse directions, right? So stresses in the transverse direction are zero, but strains are not because of course it will get thinner as we stretch it. So um, that state of stress is represented with just one non-zero value, let's say in the E1 direction, as I've pointed out here. Everything else is zero. That's a uniaxial state of stress. In this case, um, I'm marking this as tension. Um, uh, we usually take uh, positive values as tensile uh, in mechanics and uh, negative values to be compressive. So uh, now what is the consequence of this? We can go to a point inside this deformable body that is under a uniaxial state of uh, stress and if we draw the tractions on this on the small neighborhood of this point those tractions would be T sub E1, T uh, on traction on the face with a normal E1 is equal to S times E1, which would be what? Which would be what? If this is the state of, uh, it would just be sigma 0, 0, right? Sigma 0, 0. So, uh, which is what this, this looks like. Sigma in the uh, uh, in the E1 direction and that sigma is indeed equal to force divided by area right so your definition of uh, you know stress being force divided by area is as specific to this particular state of stress and a particular component of the resulting traction that particular component of the stress tensor or of the traction uh, vector sigma here is indeed equal to the total force divided by the area of cross section of this bar. Um, but keep in mind that uh, force over area is not uh, stress. In general, stress is a, uh, a tensor that has nine different components. Um, and when you act that stress on some normal, you get a traction vector. Uh, traction vector, of course, has three components. And in the uniaxial case, it's just this component that we are talking about is this is the uh, force in the even direction divided by the area of cross section. Um, all right. So that's one neighborhood. And on that neighborhood, the E2 direction gives me 0 because 0, 1, 0, when this tensor acts on 0, 1, 0 or E2, we obviously get 0 tractions on the top and the bottom surface and the, on the front and the back surfaces. The only non-zero traction is in E1. If I choose a different neighborhood like this, where N and M are two unit vectors pointing in the E1, E2, E1 plus E2 direction, and this is just to make it a unit vector. And similarly, M is in the E1 minus E2 direction, slightly different neighborhood. If I act this tensor, the uniaxial state of stress on these two normals, I get traction vectors uh, Sn equal to square root 1 over square root 2 of sigma and 1 over two, square root 2 of sigma still pointing in the E1 direction. Okay, so the magnitude of the stress 
uh, of the traction component changes because the area of this face and the area of this face is different from the area of this face. Uh, but um, uh, but in this case, we do get a traction vector that is away from the normal. Uh, it has some normal traction component. It has some shearing component, even for a uniaxial state of stress. It, so the point is, um, even for a uniaxial state of stress, you might be tempted to say there are no shearing tractions or no shearing components of the stress. That is not true because it depends um, upon what surface are you talking about. The same stress tensor acts on a different normal to give me traction vectors in this direction that are uh, different from the normal vector. So this traction vector clearly has a normal component and a shearing component on that surface. Okay. Um, yet another example of something called pure shear. Now, I think this might be the first time we are talking about pure shear. With In kinematics, you remember we talked about simple shear. Simple shear is different from pure shear. In simple shear, you remember in kinematics, we said if you have a square, we just uh, move the top surface and it uh, gets slanted by an amount, whatever, beta or alpha. That's simple shear. A state of pure shear means that the stress components would look like this nine components that you would have off diagonal uh, value of shear tau here. Everything else would be zero. And as you know that uh, the columns of the stress tensor are basically the tractions on the even E2, E3 faces. So on the even face, the traction would be pointing in the E2 direction, which is what I have de described. Sorry, on the E1 face, which is this one, traction would be pointing in the E2 direction. On the E2 phase, traction would be pointing in the E1 direction, which is what this means. And similarly, on the minus, uh, minus E1 and the minus E2 directions. So this is a cube with, um, with tractions that are pure shearing, uh, uh, with a, uh, that have a pure shear component in the E1, E2, E3 directions. And I've shown those tractions out here. But the interesting thing is that if you take a normal vector n, this particular normal that is at 45 degrees, on that face, this state of pure shear produces a traction that is along the normal, that has a pure normal component. There is zero shear on that face. This state of stress that is corresponding to pure shear produces a traction that, is ha that has only a normal component. There is no shear component on this face. Um, this is on the normal vector n, again that same normal vector that has e1 plus e2 divided by square root 2. And same thing for m, it has a pure normal component, no shear component on that. So just like in the uniaxial tension case, um, there, are, there are faces on which you get shearing components. Um, in the pure shear case, there are faces on which you get pure normal components. Okay, so you can't really say that some state of stress um, will produce only shearing tractions or only normal tractions. Um, it always depends upon the small neighborhood of the point and the particular angle at which you are taking tractions. Okay. Um, questions on this uh, aspect? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Any stress which can put any force which may be in the same direction, or uh, if we change the orientation, we get stresses, or uh, which will not be in the same direction. So, uh, you're talking about this? Yeah, but I'm generalizing it in this aspect. Okay. So, therefore, uh, any uh, combination of forces, we can find out directions uh, in which we have only shear or only uh, normal shear, right? I mean, there would be one correlation where, uh, so are those the things that we call principles, right? Uh, so, okay, yeah, I'll come to that. Uh, I'll come to that very shortly. Um, um, actually, you can see that's the next topic that I'll cover. Uh, so let me hold off uh, answering that for just a little bit, but I'll come to that. Um, uh, very quick comment here about transformation of stresses. Um, um, stress is indeed a tensor and 
um, as we have seen, any tensor expressed um, in, in, in terms of, let's say, E1, E2, E3 will have these nine components. If I pick a different basis, G1, G2, G3, then those nine components would change. And how do they change? They change according to this expression where Q was that transformation matrix that we talked about. You remember we said that um, for vectors, if I have a vector V1, V2, V3 components in E1, E2, E3, if I switch my change, if I change my uh, basis vectors, then the components V prime, V1 prime, V2 prime, V3 prime are given by Q times V. For tensors, it is Q times the tensor times Q transpose. This is the exact same relationship that holds for any tensor. Um, that's one way to obtain um, the components of stress in a different coordinate system. Another way to obtain the state, uh, the components of stress is by what's given in this note here, that take planes normal to E1 prime, E2 prime, E3 prime. Let's say these are these planes. Calculate the values of tractions on all of these six faces, or let's just, just let's just say three faces. T on the face E1 prime, T on the face E2, where is E2? There's somewhere E2, this is minus E2, so opposite here is E2, and this is T E3. If I have these tractions, then you remember when we set up the traction or the stress tensor, we said that the columns of the uh, stress tensor are the traction vectors on those coordinate directions. We can use that same logic here and say that these components of the traction would be the components of the uh, stress tensor in this modified basis. So what we are doing is taking the nine components of stress, um, acting, acting them upon these different, nor, uh, different normal vectors, obtaining the components of the tractions, and then just assembling them as columns of a stress tensor. Uh, that's an alternative way to doing this. Okay, so this is this is just uh, um, telling you how this uh, the state of stress or the stress tensor transforms between one set of coordinates e1, e2, e3, and e1 prime, e2 prime, e3 prime. And I think this is uh, exactly the same as what we did in chapter one. So I'll not um, um, go into too much detail about that point. And now back to that uh, question about the principal values of uh, stress and how that may be relating to the directions of normal normal tractions and no uh, shear, tra shear tractions. Um, so uh, we've seen that um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of stress uh, or of symmetric tensors, we know how to calculate those. Um, and we'll see a little bit later that this stress tensor is also symmetric um, for um, um, for bodies that are in, uh, for it's one of the equilibrium conditions really. So um, another way to interpret, so uh, so uh, knowing that the stress tensor, the Cauchy stress tensor is symmetric, you can calculate eigenvalues and eigenvectors for those tensors um, according to what we have done back in chapter one. There's yet another interpretation of that. Um, so, um, if we were to calculate eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a Cauchy stress tensor according to what we did back in chapter one, we would be solving this particular problem. Sn is equal to sigma n, right? Sigma being the eigenvalue, n being the eigenvector. Now, it um, an interesting property of this, this eigenvalue problem is that on these three particular um, directions, on these three particular eigen directions, Let's assume that eigenvalues and eigenvectors are distinct. So you have three different directions, uh, three unique directions in which um, we have uh, uh, that are corresponding to the eigen directions. On these three faces, the um, uh, when we act S on N to calculate traction, we immediately see that they that the traction is equal to sigma acting on N. So I'll write that here, um, even though this is nothing but this, this is how we calculate tractions. S acting on N is really the traction on that face. 
on the face that this condition or this eigen value problem is satisfied traction is equal to sigma acting on n meaning that the uh, there is only a normal component of traction on that face so yes in general um, for a state of stress um, a symmetric tensor you will be able to find at least three directions on which this statement will be valid that there will be at least these three faces on which uh, there will be only a normal direction to the traction, only a normal component to the traction, no shearing component. That is one of the definitions of um, of the eigen uh, of the eigen direction. So, um, and this is also sort of uh, uh, represented here that among all the possible unit uh, unit vectors that are uh, that are corresponding to infinitely many planes at at this point. When the stress tensor acts on these, I could be getting, I could be getting um, different traction values. But on these three directions, we get something that is proportional, uh, something that is proportional to the direction itself, uh, n vector itself. Um, and um, just as we did back in chapter one. Uh, if you know the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a tensor, you can write the spectral decomposition of any tensor. So S is just written in the in its spectral form, form like this. Um, let's take a look at what this means for those three states of stress that we talked about. For the hydrostatic uh, pressure state of stress, we know that we said stress is equal to minus p times i. Um, what are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this state of stress? What are the eigenvalues, first of all, for this stress tensor that's equal to minus p times i? Minus p, minus p, minus p, right? Three repeated roots, which means what? a sphere going to a larger or a smaller sphere, right? Any direction is an eigendirection. So in this case, I'm going to write uh, the eigenvalues sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2 is equal to sigma 3 is equal to minus p. All the three eigenvalues are the same. And any direction is eigendirection. Any vector is an eigenvector. Um, so, um, so that's that's uh, pretty obvious just because it is a, uh, it is proportional or it is uh, a multiple of the identity tensor. How about the uniaxial tension, where the state of stress, if you remember, was given by sigma at one of the diagonal values and everything else is zero. What would be the eigenvalues of this stress tensor? Right, uh, it is a special case of a diagonal uh, matrix, so its diagonal values would be its uh, its eigenvalues. So sigma one would be sigma, sigma two and sigma three both would be zero. What would be the uh, eigenvectors eigenvectors of a of a diagonal of a tensor that has only diagonal components what are the eigenvectors of that say again yeah the the unit vectors are the com, uh, coordinate directions um, for any tensor that has only diagonal components in in the basis e1 e2 e3 Automatically, E1, E2, E3 become the normal directions. Um, or sorry, the eigenvector, eigenvector directions. So N1 is E1, N2 is E2, and N3 is E3. What this state of stress physically looks like? Um, arbitrary state of vectors N being acted upon by the stress tensor producing this degenerate ellipsoid where in the even direction I have um, I have this 
major axis and in the E2 and the E3 directions I have zero. That's because of this. Right? So this is another example of, uh, of a case where lambda, the eigenvalues are zero, but um, um, or sigma the eigenvalue is zero and the other two um, and there is one of the eigenvalues non-zero. Um, so this is just visualizing what these uh, stresses look like uh, in, in our interpretation um, along with all that uh, uh, visualization that we did on the previous page. Um, how about pure shear? Pure shear was tau E1 dyad E2 plus E2 dyad E1. So E1 dyad E2 rep, uh, refers to the tensor that has one in this location. And since that is multiplied with tau, I will put tau there. Two, uh, E2 dyad E1 is this component, uh, refers to that component. And everything else is zero. Um, if I do the eigenvalue computation for this, then I'd be subtracting sigma from the diagonal values. So determinant of s minus sigma i would me would give me this equal to zero, which immediately gives me the eigenvalues are tau and minus tau. The third eigenvalue is zero, um, and the corresponding eigenvectors also I've already computed for you. But um, the way that we would interpret this is um, is a sphere of arbitrary um, normal vectors going to what? What is what is this? Is this a sphere or it is a degenerate ellipsoid, right? Degenerate ellipsoid where E3, the component in the third direction is zero. So anything in the third direction goes to zero. So this actually is a circle because the other two eigenvalues are the same. Anything in the E1 um, or the n1 direction is multiplied by tau times n1. Anything in the n2 direction is multiplied by minus tau times n2. That's why this vector goes to the opposite direction. This vector remains the same direction. This vector is nullified. Um, so that's yet another uh, way to interpret these is in the state of pure shear. In addition to all of those interpretations uh, that we had on the previous page, in terms of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, these are the exact same interpretations that we had back in uh, chapter one. Okay. Um, questions on on this? Um, all we are doing is trying to understand what um, what a stress tensor is. How can we represent it? So, as I said, stress tensor can be represented by considering a small neighborhood of a point and drawing the tractions on all the possible faces at that point, um, which can be done in this form with different small neighborhoods being considered, or you can see uh, an arbitrary ball of sphere, uh, uh, arbitrary sphere of uh, normal vectors and what, uh, what corresponding ellipsoid it goes to. Um, all right, yet another uh, way to uh, interpret stress tensors. And this is something that uh, hopefully you've seen before. I know you've seen before, but maybe um, uh, only for a planar state of stress, not in the three dimensions. Um, and this is, um, as you know, called Mohr circle representation of a state of stress. What that means is that um, um, in three dimensions, if you calculate, if you calculate this eigenvalue problem, you get sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, and n one, n two, n three for uh, for a particular point inside a deformable body. Um, you can represent that state of stress using this Mohr circle diagram, where the x-axis is the normal component of the uh, of the stress. The y component is the shear, or the y axis is the shear component of the stress. You pick three points, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. These are the values, the eigenvalues uh, corresponding, to the, corresponding to the state of stress. Once you have that, then you can draw these circles. And what do these circles represent? They are 
um, they are the states of stress on on a face that would be normal um, that would be in the direction let's say on the face uh, let's look at this red circle this red circle has values sigma 1 and sigma 2 um, on the opposite sides and at the center of the red circle which is here if I make an angle twice or two times theta 1 2 then within the E1 E2 plane that means that I'm rotating my unit normal by an amount theta theta 1 2 in this case so if I um, if I look at a face that is normal to E1 that would be this face right as I rotate my amount theta 1 2 then the traction on that face would be given by this point that that particular point will have some amount of normal traction and the corresponding amount of shear, tra shear traction. That is what hopefully you all uh, should recall what Mohr circle did. And as you go through an angle of 180 degrees, that then you have really just rotated that theta 1 by 90 degrees and you, uh, uh, and you get to the other uh, other direction from E1 to E2. The same thing holds for the other two planes, sigma or theta 1, 3 and theta 2, 3. But the important thing is that um, in when you rotate by some amount in let's say theta 1, theta 2, 3 plane and then you rotate in the theta 1, 3 plane, then this picture gets messy. So you have to first find out the principal values of the, all the three uh, directions and only then you can construct these circles and try to figure out um, what would be the state of stress um, on a particular direction where you are rotating only with respect, only one of the uh, three possible combinations. So what does the hydrostatic pressure Mohr circle look like? Looks like a dot. Why? Because sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2 is equal to sigma 3. So there are no circles. There is just one dot. No matter which direction you pick, you will always be getting a normal traction uh, on that surface. And that uh, value of that traction would be equal to P. Um, what's the uniaxial tension look like? You have one value sigma 1 that is equal to uh, sigma. The other two are zero. So sigma two and sigma three are zero, which means that this green circle is a dot. The red and the blue circle are these the, are coincident. That's what uniaxial tension looks like in terms of Mohr circle. Pure shear um, in the face sigma uh, in the face E1 E2 that red circle has eigenvalues plus tau and minus tau. The third eigenvalue is zero. So we have three definite circles in this case, but um, essentially we are again plotting the same thing for these three states of stress. They are being represented in, uh, in a, using that Mohr circle representation. So um, if you recall how uh, Mohr circles work, then um, even this is conveying uh, the same information about these three states of stress uh, to you, okay? Um, all right, so it looks like we are out of time here. Um, I will not go into the partial differential equations today. Um, 